much, Alina. Thank you very much for all of the organizers for uh, giving me the opportunity to talk uh, at the Number Theory Web Seminar. I'm very excited to give this talk. So um, indeed, I'll be talking about uh, Charles' non-vanishing conjecture, and this is all joint work with uh, Peter Koemans and Mark Schusterman. And um, essentially, the result is the following, that if you fix a time power, uh, 3 modulo 4, uh, we prove that uh, if you range over the quadratic character, so the function field, the rational function field, uh, FQT, and you order them by the size of the discriminant, uh, these are these polynomials, uh, or FQT, uh, then for 100% of them, you have that the uh, value of the L function at the half point is uh, non zero. So, this is a probabilistic version of Charles non vanishing conjecture. And um, uh, essentially, this is a very high level uh, overview, but I will uh, we'll see the detail, more details of this. Uh, we um, achieve this by controlling a certain sequence of um, uh, higher Selmer groups uh, attached to this problem that are able to uh, eventually determine this 100% uh, result. So um, the key aspect of this, the key technical aspect of this Selmer group is that within the technologies uh, developed so far, they suffer of a certain very specific uh, pathology. And um, I will explain what, what we do to uh, overcome the, the problems created by this uh, pathology. All right, so the broad overview of the talk is that I will first uh, provide some uh, general context for a Charles and uh, vanishing conjecture, both over the rational, which is the case Charles considered first, and uh, over the function field FQT. And uh, I will introduce this uh, mysterious sequence of spaces that I I mentioned uh, the chi, and I will um, uh, explain how uh, these phases are able to um, essentially govern the non vanishing of the L function uh, at the half point. And um, I will overview the methods that are currently known to control such the distribution of two infinity cellular uh, groups in quadratic twist families. And what are the limitations? What is the reason for the limitations created by the pathology? So we'll see very soon what the pathology is. And I will explain what is the key additional new input that we introduced to, in this very specific case, to overcome uh, the pathologies. So let's uh, get started with the statement of uh, Chawla's uh, conjecture. So Chawla conjecture that if you take actually any Dirichlet uh, character and you take the, um, uh, the, the L function, uh, then uh, a half should never, literally never be zero of uh, the L function. But there are broader conjectures about linear dependency of the zeros over the rationals. I will not uh, go into them, but that's a uh, special case of a broader set of conjectures. And um, Katz and Sarnak, um, uh, and the, they have a more general framework that sort of give theoretical evidence for these conjectures. And under GRH, we were able to prove that if you order your characters by the absolute value of D, basically chi of D is the quadratic character of square root of D, uh, uh, then um, a positive proportion of them indeed satisfy Charles' conjecture, 15 over 16. And uh, it was a big breakthrough in 2000 when uh, Sander Arish uh, proved that uh, within the family of uh, odd square free, okay, here there are some technical extra conditions, but essentially a positive proportion of uh, uh, quadratic character, 87.5%, had uh, non vanishing at the half point. And um, this was the first uh, such uh, unconditional result giving uh, actual positive proportion uh, uh, for the non-vanishing in support of Charles conjecture and uh, Jutila previously at uh, lower bound that grow, was growing as x over root log, uh, over log x. All right, uh, what happens uh, actually over function? So Charles conjecture actually does not uh, uh, hold literally a bottom over a 
function field uh, vulnerably in 2018 was able to construct uh, the power of x, x to the one fifth uh, quadratic characters of FQT for every single Q um, uh, that going up to x, such that you have a vanishing at the half point. So the, the exact formulation that for every single uh, quadratic character you should have no vanishing is uh, false, and it's false even if you ask finitely many, and there is this, even this lower bound growing as some power of x, x to the fifth in the worst case scenario. Um, uh, however, uh, the sort of Katz-Sarnak uh, type of heuristics um, leads to the belief that um, a probabilistic version of Charles conjecture should still be correct uh, also over function fields. So uh, the failures of the uh, non-vanishing, so the number of vanishing should uh, asymptotically be 0% of the um, uh, totality of quadratic characters. So if you order your characters up to x, you should see a smaller and smaller proportion uh, of uh, the vanishing. So um, that's uh, what I, uh, I'll call the probabilistic version of Charles conjecture. And there is um, quite uh, a lot of support there you know, for, for, such, for such a statement. So uh, work of Bui and Florea from 2016 proves that uh, uh, at least 94.27% of the quadratic characters, um, uh, you, you have non vanish at the half point. And um, I, as I mentioned before, this is not just for quadratic characters, the conjecture is for any Dirichlet character. So you can, Pick other families, and for instance, uh, David, uh, Chantal David, Alexander Flore, Mathilde Lalen in 2020, they um, were able to provide a positive proportion of uh, non vanishing in the family of uh, cubic characters. And um, finally, I also would like to mention in 2021, um, uh, Ellenberg, uh, Lee, and Schusterman um, uh, proved. Non vanishing uh, for a positive proportion over a function field, but uh, the additional feature is that the proportion uh, tends to one as q goes to infinity. So if you move q uh, to infinity, if you take it bigger and bigger, you get better and better uh, lower bounds for the for the non vanishing. And um, I will already mention that in all these results, uh, the half point is uh, not playing a special role for this probabilistic, both in what is expected and what is, these methods uh, so far have been able to prove, uh, it should be uh, the same for other points of the uh, half line. All right, so that's uh, an overview of uh, what is known so far. So if I fix Q, um, so far, either you know straight away uniformly for all Q 94 to 27%, and if uh, instead you move Q to infinity, you are able to get better and better. Lower. So the result I want to present today, as I mentioned at the beginning, is a uh, joint work with uh, Peter Coyman and Mark Schusterman, where uh, instead we fix uh, Q, but asking that has to be congruent to three modulo four. And then uh, we prove that within the family of imaginary quadratic characters, chi of FQT, we have uh, non-vanishing you know, of L of chi uh, for uh, 100%. So here Q is fixed and we have 100% of uh, non-vanishing. And imaginary here, this is a function field, so you might be a bit confused what do I mean by uh, imaginary, it means that um, it is given by the square root uh, of a polynomial that has odd degree. So if you like, in a more geometric formulation, it corresponds to an hyperelliptic uh, cover of P1 that uh, ramifies at the infinite uh, point, at infinity. Um, so there are some assumptions here, first of all, we have the family of imaginary quadratics, we have the half point, and I just mentioned a minute ago that both in terms of heuristics and in terms of results, people have considered other points on the half line. And these, the methods we are using is uh, so far really tailored uh, to the half point. So the method is uh, sensitive to the choice of the base point. 
And uh, furthermore, okay, there is the assumption that the character is marginal. As far as I can say, I believe that there might be a remedy. But at the moment, we are working with this uh, family, and uh, I would bet that, that the result can be extended also to the case where um, it's either a split or inert at infinity, so polynomials of even degree. But what uh, is instead uh, fairly important is the assumption that is uh, the Q is a prime power that is three modulo four. So the case where Q is one modulo four, which is the same uh, assumption that basically your function fit f to t as a i as a fourth root of u. So this case is generally different, and the SAMR techniques that we are using are very sensitive of this change, and uh, I believe this requires uh, generally new inputs. And so this is really uh, an important assumption. It's not just out of laziness. While imaginary quadratic, uh, I believe we might be able to. And the other base point is also something extremely sensitive. So for now, we'll just stick to that. Uh, half. Okay, so this is the main theorem, and um, hopefully the assumptions, uh, especially Q congruent to three modulo four, will sort of come back during will, will become clear during the talk, and uh, and now sort of want to gradually build up and tell you um, the ideas of the problem. And so, in the first place, uh, what's the connection between? Uh, Vanishing of the at the half point and cell groups. So I told you that we we achieved this result by controlling the distribution of certain cell groups in quadratic twist family. It seems uh, pretty far objects, the uh, L function at the half and, and the uh, object like class group and cell groups. So the connection is built as follows. Um, you can view your character as uh, the quadratic character attached to uh, a square free uh, non constant say, polynomial uh, over FQT. And the assumption that is imaginary precisely means that it is odd degree polynomial. So now you fix uh, an auxiliary prime L uh, co prime to Q. And um, the key thing is that uh, there is more structure to that fact. And to explain this uh, additional structure, I'll introduce the, the hyperelliptic curve attached to the function field square root f, so c of chi, y square is f of t is an affine equation, uh, defined over fq, and this corresponds essentially uniquely to the character. So f here is the same f, chi equal chi of f. So you have this nice curve. And um, now um, the Bayes conjectures uh, come and tell you that the vanishing at a half uh, can be reconstructed uh, in sort of linear algebra terms uh, uh, by essentially asking that the action of the Frobenius operator on the elliptic state model, so L here is the additional prime, the auxiliary prime that I'm using on the Jacobian of psi of the C of chi. So this is an abelian variety attached to C of chi, this should um, have a square root of Q as uh, eigenvalue. So you have vanishing if and only if square root of Q is an eigenvalue of the Frobenius operator acting on this uh, elliptic state law. So there is some sort of um, uh, linear algebra, if you want, or matrix theoretic interpretation for every L, you can choose your favorite auxiliary prime L, and you can measure the vanishing by checking whether the eigenvalues of Frobenius are or are square root of Q. If one of them is, then you have bash. Okay, excellent. And uh, by the way, that's exactly how uh, Van Lee has constructed her examples. Um, she starts with a single example of uh, vanishing, which you can always achieve either with an elliptic curve or with uh, the restriction of an elliptic curve according to whether Q is a square or not. You, anyways, there is a single example of vanishing, and, and then um, you consider the family of polynomials F that are obtained by essentially base changing this example by a map of P1. So you compose uh, F0, compose with 
G, and then this is constructed in such a way that the resulting hyperelliptic curve maps on your uh, starting uh, example. And then there is a theory of uh, on and date that tells you that, the, that, that this will basically tell you that the Jacobian has um, uh, in his isogeny class uh, one of, as a factor one of uh, either this hyper, either this elliptic curve or this uh, abelian surface, which detects the vanishing. So if if G if F not uh, as vanishing automatically if not composed with G as auto vanishing, and then it's a matter of checking that uh, in this way you produce many different F in principle uh, modulo squares. So many different square free. F and you can sort of, if G is degree five, it's reasonable you get that power that I wrote X to the one fifth. So that's the family uh, of counter examples to the literal Chawla conjecture. So the little, asking literally that the L function never vanishes. And um, then you might think that essentially an approach could be, okay, I, I just check, uh, modulo L in this, uh, this Frobenius matrix uh, is an elliptic matrix. I just check whether modulo L for some auxiliary prime L. It so happens that uh, square root of Q is not uh, an eigenvalue. So you take the L torsion um, of the Jacobian, you take this eigenspace, and you might try to prove that, for instance, it's the trivial eigenspace. So then it certainly means that uh, you have non vanishing. Uh, at the half point. And uh, a way of looking at this is in some sense, we are trying to control um, the uh, elliptic absolute value instead of the infinity absolute value of the Archimedean absolute value of the L function. Instead of saying that is a big uh, in the Archimedean, is big in the Archimedean sense to prove that it doesn't vanish, you prove it that it's a big in some uh, other place of Q, some other auxiliary prime L. This is uh, the rough uh, uh, idea you might decide to uh, follow. And then the, the question you have to face is what do we know about the, this uh, sequence of, of eigenspaces on the L torsion of the Jacobian as you bear the quadratic character chi? So such questions are, uh, as I'm going to convince you, uh, hopefully in the next slide, <coughs> very much. Yes. Yeah? Uh, sorry, such interpretation that you said. L function uh, is zero if and only if uh, square root. Uh, do we have such inf interpretation in the case of Q, a rational number? Of Q? No, not for uh, the honest uh, L functions, but as was suggested to me by Jordan Ellenberg, you have it for uh, the other L functions. There is something very similar, and actually that was really what motivated Eva Sava to develop uh, if I have a theory was to somehow, what are the type of L functions over Q that have a similar sort of Galois theoretic uh, interpretation about the, 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 the zeros of the, the, the theta function. So yes, unfortunately, no, this is really something, uh, a story either over FQT or a story over Q for uh, not the usual L functions, but for things like periodic L functions. Yes. So, uh, for example, L function uh, at one then is not non-zero. We have Dirichlet theorem, uh, infinitely yes. many primes. But for one yes. half, maybe uh, at one we have half, to. Think. Yeah, it would be very okay. interesting. Right. At the half point, I'm not aware of any interpretation uh, like this. I would be really surprised. But if you have any ideas on that, I would be very interested. Uh, maybe maybe we have to think about Gaussian primes rather than ordinary primes. For example, I see. Yeah, maybe. I, I'm, I'm, yeah. I'm happy to talk more about this, if you like, uh, after the oh, Thank you. Yeah, no problem. OK, so, um, so yes, but thanks a lot for the question. This is really the place where you see the function field in all this story coming out that, that the L functions over function field have this uh, much uh, sort of more uh, algebraic structure behind there where you can really take an elliptic matrix and read off the, the vanishing of the L function at the point in terms of the behavior of the eigenvalues of this, of this matrix. Uh, 
All right, so the question, if you take such an approach, you have to ask uh, the question, what do we know about this uh, uh, eigenspace of the earth ocean? And I want to convince you in the next slide that this is very much a question in the style of the Cohen Lenster uh, heuristics. So let me make a quicker, some sort of analogy instead of the more complicated polynomial from Q squared minus Q, I just take the polynomial X minus one. So the one eigenspace from Q minus one. And I look uh, instead, what do we know about the behavior of the uh, L torsion? Um, of the from Q minus one eigenspace. The from Q minus one eigenspace of the L torsion is the same. So uh, since chi is uh, imaginary, it's uh, not hard to convince yourself that uh, uh, this is nothing else than the, the L torsion of the class group of uh, FQT root F. So if you're used for algebraic number theory, this is verbatim exactly the, the class group constructed exactly in the same case as for, uh, or imaginary uh, quadratic and maximal order, you, you do it uh, over FQT and you ask the behavior of the L torsion of the class group as you vary your polynomial F among odd degree polynomials. So what do we know about this, uh, uh, the behavior of the L torsion of the class group? Conjecture, there is a very nice conjecture of Cohen and Langstra which I guess at least when Q is not one or no L is essentially already in the paper of Cohen Lenz over, uh, over Q, but there's a straightforward version of the functional field, adaptation of the functional field, which gives you a, a conjecture about the distribution of these spaces. Essentially, what is the probability that this space is zero dimensional, one dimensional, two dimensional? So for every possible rank of this vector space, it tells you the expected probability for achieving rank equal to R. R is your favorite rank. So we expect conjecture this eigenspace, the identity eigenspace, follows uh, a very uh, nice distribution. Unfortunately, this is out of, uh, for L odd, and I am fixing here uh, L uh, an odd prime. This will come. Uh, back soon, uh, why I made this choice, but so far let's just fix L of, and uh, for L of this is uh, completely uh, open at the moment. Um, however, over function fields, uh, something fairly close to the common lens heuristic is known. And this was uh, a breakthrough in 2009 of uh, Ellenberg, Venkatesh, and Westerland that introduced the method coming from uh, Topology, the study of the stable homology of orbit spaces that gave them uh, upper and lower bounds that are approaching to, for the behavior of this uh, torsion that are getting closer and closer to the Cohen Lenz heuristics as you send Q to infinity. And very, very roughly, there is way more to it. You can look at the paper if you want. Uh, uh, the non vanishing result of uh, Ellen, Merli, and Schusterman. Um, Adapt the techniques that you have from Elmer, Benkadesh, and Westerland to this different, more complicated eigenspace from Q squared minus Q. And uh, the, you get in this way lower bounds to the proportion of convention that are approaching one as Q equals infinity, as I mentioned uh, uh, before. So this, this, is, uh, uh, this, this work was sort of the uh, first place where uh, over function fields, uh, one takes this new approach of not estimating the Archimedean absolute value of the uh, uh, L function at the half, but you take another auxiliary prime and you try to estimate the logic uh, absolute value to obtain progress towards probabilistic Charles conjecture. However, the limitation, the current limitations for L odd that we have for the Cohen Lenz heuristics are so that. At the moment, we only get uh, approximate results that become sharper and sharper when you send the parameter Q of the function field uh, to infinity. And uh, then what else can you try to do uh, for a fixed Q? So now you fix Q and you are not allowed, L of is out of question at the moment, at least for proving Cohen lens type of uh, results for such an eigenspace. But then what else can you do? Well, I said that L is the odd, and then there is one case left, 
with this idea, and that's the case of n equal to two. And that's exactly the prime that we exploit here. And uh, maybe you start getting a feeling of why the con that's related to the fact that we take a congruence of modulo four on Q. All right, so um, now that I told you this, I should explain why in the first place uh, uh, in this coherence the heuristics and uh, uh, why I excluded so far the case of uh, um, n equal to. So why uh, actually I sorted out uh, n equal to in the um, coherence uh, uh, heuristics and why, why don't, don't we directly try to prove the, the two torsion maybe of the eigenspace from Q squared minus Q, the Charles eigenspace is actually three. Why, why don't we do that? So to understand that properly, let us go back to the analogy to the simpler eigenspace from Q minus one. This is just the class group. So if you're familiar of, with class group of imaginary quadratic fields, you will be familiar with what I'm gonna say next. And uh, indeed, let me remind you that, that this is the two torsion of the Jacobian, the from Q minus one eigenspace is nothing else than the two torsion of the class group of the quadratic order FQT root F. And it is a very classical fact called genus theory that the dimension of this space is entirely predictable. And actually the space itself is entirely predictable, the two torsion space itself is dimension equal to the number of prime factors omega F minus one of F minus one. So typically for a random polynomial F of if this was over the integer for a random integer, the, you get a lot of prime factors. So typically this, this two torsion space is gigantic. So there is, for a, it seems to go in the opposite direction. For 100%, you get, you get a massive two torsion. So um, that's not good. And it's also not good for the coherence heuristics. If you want to add a distribution, there is no distribution whatsoever you can opt for because the dimension of the first space is already exploding. So with probability one, you, you don't get any even rank uh, as a two, as a dimension of the two torsion. However, um, uh, it was well known and expected that, um, the, it was very much expected that if you uh, get rid of this massive exploding piece inside of the two part of the class, but the rest should behave exactly like in the case of the coherence should grow in the same, with the same flows. And this was uh, very much open uh, until 2017 and where Alex Smith uh, introduced uh, a number of methods and then his work uh, sort of, uh, was further generalized. He further generalized his work uh, for more general uh, uh, settings. Uh, and so the, you can find it two final preprints, they date 2022. And despite the work is over number fields, if you sort of use the method, it's not hard to literally translate the method and prove, and here you already see this assumption coming, that when Q is congruent to three modulo four, uh, then once you get rid of the two torsion, so you double your group, you kill the two torsion, then the rest of the group should follow exactly the correlation distribution. All right, so that's um, uh, regarding the one again space. And then let's go back to the non-vanishing. So if you follow the original naive idea and you look at the two torsion, you might hope already to make it with the two torsion. And unfortunately, that's really not the case. Typically, you get something similar to omega f, even more than that, actually, um, uh, for the size of the two torsion is eigen space uh, from Q squared minus Q. So you get a really massive amount of, of uh, classes which are essentially going in the opposite direction. But then following this progression that you see in the previous two uh, points, uh, you can then make the following plan at least, perhaps uh, after the two torsion, whatever you uh, build on top should typically be fine. So, uh, in other words, you can plan to prove, to extend the Smith's result from the one eigen space to the square root Q eigen space and prove that uh, determine the distribution of the two infinity torsion of the from Q square minus Q eigen space. And so you prove a stronger result, which has a, very, has a special case, the consequence that for 100% of the time, the space is fine. And this space being finite, remember, is exactly the same as uh, saying, thanks to the veil conjecture, saying that you have non-vanishing 
at a half point. So for 100% of the current. So the plan that you might decide to follow is to determine the distribution of the double of the eigenspace, the two infinity. All right, and um, uh, uh, this I will now guide you through this. Uh, now we arrive finally at my, at my promise sequence of spaces, F, P, and K, sort of cellular spaces that are uh, F2 vector spaces and are detecting uh, the known vanish. So it would be convenient um, to switch from the Jacobian that was in the previous slide to sort of the dual object. And um, you can do this essentially thanks to plus field theory. You can detect uh, um, these eigenspace in the Jacobian also in terms of unramified extensions of uh, your uh, function field FQT root F. And for that, I have to introduce just a little bit of notation. There is a, there is a character, um, there is a module, Galois module uh, T chi that uh, as an abelian group is always the same, but the Galois model structure uh, changes as you change the character. Basically you twist it by um, acting, uh, there is minus one here to the chi sigma times x. So you essentially change the Galois model structure of the of z2 root q, q is three modulo four and chi is imaginary. So z2 root q is uh, uh, just, nice uh, PID, it's a ring inside uh, the ramified extension Q2 root Q of, of Q. And inside you have this kind of dual object Q2 root Q modulo Z2 root Q. These are two modules so far, so good. But the point is that when uh, Q is three modulo four and have no when Chi is imaginary, uh, it is a true statement that you are vanishing at a, a function. If and only if you can construct a Gallo extension uh, on top of uh, FQT root F, that uh, is basically this semi-direct product, T chi semi-direct with C2 times F2, um, where the action is given by the formulas above, essentially, which is unramified above FQT chi. So if you're lost here and you've followed until the previous slide, so until here we had this plan of determining the two infinity of the uh, Jacobian, and for technical reasons, it's much more convenient to talk about a ramified extension. And class field theory gives you basically a dictionary between these two things. And this formulation, for technical reasons, is essentially the same as the same plan as before, but instead now we do it, um, uh, we approach it uh, with a ramified extension. And um, uh, essentially, uh, to find such a homomorphism, uh, is the same as finding a one cos article valid in a TK. If you take the coordinate, this is a very general thing, a semi-direct product, that the coordinate uh, function uh, in a semi-direct product is the same as a one cos valid in TK. And that justifies why uh, one introduces the space. The finally introduce the promise vector spaces over F2, B and K, uh, which are basically the, uh, are ramified uh, quadratic extensions uh, uh, of your uh, FQT root F that come by multiplication by one minus root Q to a suitable power uh, times the next power. So this, this condition n plus two, n plus three makes, makes it sure that you are uh, in F2. So you, are, you have something in vector space. So this looks a bit technical, uh, it's what it is. Uh, the upshot you can take for now, this, in case you're confused, is that this is just uh, a sequence of uh, F2 vector spaces and that is detecting uh, the, the non-vanishing through classic uh, theory. And more precisely, the non-vanishing is detected as follows, that you have uh, that the L function doesn't vanish at the out point, if and only if the sequence of vector spaces, which by the way, are one inside the next, uh, is eventually one that so the decreasing sequence of vector space, and it's not hard to check that there is always one element inside of this sequence of vector space, which is the constant field extension. Um, if this uh, sequence collapses to uh, this element, then you have no match. So now I delivered the promise of uh, providing a decreasing sequence of vector space that uh, detects the non-vanishing of the L function. And um, 
So the goal is to determine their distribution. And um, to do that, I will for now just say that you can attach a dual sequence of vector spaces, um, WN, that comes together with a pairing. Uh, and uh, the property of the pairing is F to bed. It is exactly the, the text, the next space, BN plus one, uh, for uh, when you take the left kernel, so the things that completely kill WN, and the text, the next space also for WN by taking the right kernel, the things that completely kill BN inside WN. So there is more structure here. This sequence of vector spaces come with a sequence of dual vector spaces and together with a sequence of pairings. And uh, the ideas of Smith, I will explain in a second why the case of the class group, the use of the one again space can be reformulated in such, a, in such terms and become something very elemental in that case, what is BN, what is WN, and what is R10. I will tell you in a second what that is. But uh, let me just start to mention what the pathology is that I said at the beginning of the talk that we had to deal with, is that the ideas of Smith work very well as long as the first spaces are disjoint. A bit, something a bit stronger than that, but certainly you are in trouble in case uh, the two spaces Coincide. And I hope to tell you something about that. And um, for us, it is the case that the two spaces are, ex two, two starting spaces are always exactly the same space. So um, before going next in the explanation of the strategy, how you accomplish such a goal, I want to explain, uh, to demystify a little bit the sequence of vector spaces and the sequence of uh, uh, pairings into something that should be more familiar probably to you using this analogy with the one again space. So this is the usual class group. And uh, the VN chi here is not, the analog of the VN chi is nothing else than uh, the two torsion classes that are divisible, the dual two torsion classes that are divisible by two to the n. That in the dual class group, they you can divide by two to the n, that class. You can find another psi that, such that two to the n times psi is equal to, to chi prime. And uh, WN is the same in the dual world for, so for the usual class group, and U is the same space, basically, aside from that. Classes, two torsion classes that are divisible by two to the N. And you see again these two exponents that differ by one for the same reason, so that you land the two torsion. Okay, uh, and the Artin pairing, how is defined? It is defined by cho choosing a random lift here, two to the M psi is chi prime, and then you just evaluate. You evaluate with the reciprocity law, you send B, the Artin symbol of B in the lift. And then you can use that um, B is already divisible by two to the N to check that this is well defined. It doesn't depend on the choice of the lift. And it has the property exactly of detecting what is divisible by two to the N plus one uh, in both the dual class group and the usual class. It's a completely elementary fact. And um, okay, so whatever these spaces uh, of co-cycles uh, that I uh, introduced in the case of Chawla, where uh, they are the analog of this very elementary uh, abelian groups uh, story. Um, and uh, let me now tell you how to do uh, the sequence of spaces. So uh, both for the one eigen space and for the square root q eigen space, so for the Chawla eigen space, it turns out this is essentially a generalization of something that dates back to the work of the uh, in the 1930s uh, of uh, Laszlo Rede. Um, uh, he was the first to give a description of the four torsion of the uh, class group of the quadratic field, and that generalizes. And um, the spaces B1 and W1 in this story are decided by a matrix of the chapter symbols. So you take chi, you take all the prime divisors, you compute all, you, you put them as rows and arrows of a matrix, uh, sorry, as, as columns and uh, rows of a matrix, and, and uh, you, you take uh, all the mutual genre symbols. And the left kernel of this matrix is uh, B1, and the right kernel is W1. And um, uh, once, if you're able to do that, if you're able to decide what is the probability that this matrix of the genre symbol has a given dimension, then what I'm going to overview uh, in the remaining nine minutes is how you control the sequence of uh, successes. So you now know 
both V1 and W1 are. And to know V2 and W2, you need to control the pairing arc one on V1 times W1. And essentially at a very high level, the method goes by proving that this pairing arc one is equidistributed. It's all possible uh, matrices with that given uh, rank. So V1 and W1. And, um, the way you prove such a distribution statements are uh, through what I, are called reflection principles, and I will explain what they are. They are essentially relations among arc pairings, and uh, when you change the field, the character chi, and um, these reflection principles is exactly the place of the proof. This is relations between the, uh, the pairings as you change a character is exactly a place in the proof. That breaks down when the space we want. So this is a very very high level overview of uh, what goes into the method of how the method is uh, subdivided. And um, let me explain uh, these uh, reflection principles. So these are useful relations among uh, the entries of the pairing when you take nicely arranged sets of characters. And what nice here means uh, exactly is a little bit. Uh, lengthy, but okay. These are uh, essentially the cubes of fields. So, where the length of the cube is exactly uh, uh, is exactly uh, n plus two, where n is uh, the n of the arcing pair. Sorry, this s here should be. Uh, n. Um, so, um, you arrange, uh, you take uh, a two to the n plus two. Uh, uh, different fields, so yeah, this is two to the n plus two. Sorry, uh, and these are primes. They are all co-prime with each other. They are all distinct. They are all co-prime to f not. And this is a way to write uh, two to the n plus two different fields. And um, uh, you sort of take there are here two further cubes where you stop your index at n plus one and at n. So these are c two, c one, and c zero. Three cubes, and um, the reflection principle proves. Uh, goes as follows, you assume that um, you have, uh, for each point on this cube, you have um, uh, elements A chi and B chi um, that are in, in, the, in the respective spaces, Bn uh, and Wn, and they are changing in two different bits. So uh, A is varying here and B is varying here. And for the rest, they are the same character, literally the same for all the fields at the same time. And um, uh, what you prove is that under some inductive assumptions, there is a basic an equation that expresses the variation of our total variation of our pairings, modulo two. So you sum these art pairings along this cube, the total cube, that's governed by the uh, difference of the art symbol in a field that depends only on the cubes you want. And depends in a kind of asymmetric way where the, the first n indices play a symmetric role and the last index, the one of uh, A is a special. So this is a slightly intricate combinatorial setup, but it's a combinatorial setup where one finds useful relations among uh, art impairing of art impairings of uh, moving fields. So you find such um, equations and um, the, 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 the key input is that um, uh, you have to ask here that A and B are moving in different bits. So uh, as I mentioned, A is moving here, so here there is A and B is moving here. So uh, exa for example, A cannot be equal to B here. So what to do when instead, for instance, A is equal to B. In that case, for instance, when you have B1 equal to W1, you, you, you simply don't have such, uh, such uh, uh, reflection principles. And uh, yes, so um, such a reflection principles, once you have the uh, long way still of very genius combinatorics and uh, uh, invented by Alex Smith to, to use these uh, relations to prove equidistribution of the uh, art and pairing. And, um, uh, this, this issue the, of the A equal to B of these patho pathological spaces, which for typical families of chi don't happen, but sometimes happen, 
was phased first uh, in this uh, joint work uh, with uh, Peter Koimans, where in 2022 we proved Stephen Hagen's conjecture on the solvability of the negative perturbation. And that also came down to the distribution of uh, Selmer groups uh, in, 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 in a pathological case where B1 is equal to W1. So what did we do there? We found an exotic uh, reflection principle. So uh, a reflection principle for A against A. And you have to lower to a cube of one dimension less. And essentially the output is that you under the new combinatorial arrangement where A is bearing on all the points of the cube, we found under similar inductive assumptions as in the Smith case, um, that the sum of A versus A is equal still to the splitting behavior of the prime PN plus one PN plus two in a field depending only on uh, the, the two to the N dimensional cube. And uh, yet there is minus one, uh, and that's ex exactly the character uh, minus one that is um, uh, characterizing this family and is the responsible for the symmetry at the first stage. The, the reason why you have V1 is equal to W1 is exactly that you go in a family where all the primes are splitting completely, are one modulo four. And that forces uh, the quadratic reciprocity to be sim perfectly symmetric and forces these two spaces to be. And somehow you exploit this character and uh, you do this using a bunch of reciprocity laws that we discovered for this sort of maps phi that depend um, only on, on such cubes. Um, and uh, uh, these reciprocity laws, uh, they are a generalization of a law, a reciprocity law of Redei, and um, we call them higher Redei reciprocity, and we use them repeatedly to prove this uh, exotic reflection principle. And uh, in this uh, thing, it was in this work was uh, crucial that uh, the space W1 came with a special class. And the special class uh, you, was automatically in the space and it played a crucial role in the mechanics uh, of the proof. And uh, in Chaula, there is no analog of such a special class. And if you try to do the same thing, you simply don't know where to start. However, you can get. Uh, inspiration and the inspiration comes from the fact that these spaces always contain a special character, which is the constant field uh, extension character, epsilon, which plays exactly the same role as chi minus one. And it's a little bit technical, but let me tell you that um, uh, the, unlike the cloud group, now there is also a sort of slightly bigger part of this uh, Galois modules that are bearing with chi that is fixed. And that is a two dimensional space, which is non-trivial as a Galois module because chi epsilon acts non-trivially in this Galois module. And essentially you can get inspiration from what happened in the negative pair case to find a different combinatorial arrangement where some part of this character A is varying along all the cube and there is an exotic reflection principle where minus one is replaced by this, this special character. All right, so summing uh, things up uh, with exotic reflection principle, we uh, can prove relations between acting pairings also when you have symmetry and then you can prove that the sequence of spaces B and chi follows a variant of the Cohen lens heuristics. And uh, this shows in particular that the spaces B and chi are almost surely collapsing to a one dimensional vector space. And thanks to the Bayle conjectures, uh, sorry, that, that is, thanks to classical theory, that is equivalent to say that root Q is not an eigenvalue of Frobenius for 100% of the chi. And thanks to the Bayle conjectures, you know, they're almost surely. Uh, that function doesn't match, and that's a good point. Where to start. <laughs>